Welcome everyone, this is Mary Eggert, founder of Global Waterworks, and I'm delighted to be here for our Network for Water, and uh, look forward to your participation in today's call because we have some amazing speakers here with us. And uh, um, our agenda will include a basic overview of Global Waterworks resources, an introduction to two amazing um, experts who have developed uh, water risk risk maps and also a number of assessments and water saving products that people can use today to start to make a difference with our uh, water future. And I wanted you all to know that uh, Global Waterworks is a, a provider of resources to support the future of our waterways and uh, better management of them. We accelerate uh, the adoption of water saving solutions by introducing a uh, business to the experts and uh, the tools that are helping to make water work. Um, we invite you to go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, and uh, um, tap into the resources that are already there. You will find on the solutions page in particular um, access to these webinars as well as to the assessments that have already been created for your use many of them free, as we'll hear about today. And um, also, linked in the assessments on the solutions page is access to our LinkedIn site, Network for Water, which includes many experts in the water industry already, including uh, the Great Lakes Commission, uh, the Plumbing Manufacturers International, IAPMO, uh, the, the leader of um, the Institute for Water Business, and uh, individuals around the globe who are helping water work and can provide answers to solutions as well as updates on events that uh, you may want to participate in. Uh, finally, what makes uh, water work and uh, helps people more quickly adopt the solutions that are available is the business case. And many of you have been involved in creating case studies and solutions that show real economic impact as well as a boost in morale and uh, uh, tremendous uh, um, community building support and reputational support uh, and we invite you to share those case studies with us uh, that's where you can go on our, our website to make an impact and we will promote those case studies if you go to our uh, Global Waterworks YouTube channel, you will find a complete uh, almost encyclopedia of resources talking about commercial water saving solutions, case studies using technology, and um, many of the experts who are sharing the research and uh, the data available to help us all make water work better for the future. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker uh, who comes uh, to us from uh, the World Resources in Institute. And um, Betsy Otto is actually uh, an alumni from two different schools I've attended, uh, UW-Madison and Northwestern, but she's a graduate of the Center uh, the School of Design at Harvard in Enver Environmental Studies. And she has overseen the Aqueduct Project, which uh, provides a tremendous maps and uh, resources for people to assess future water risks. So Betsy, welcome to today's uh, call. I hope you'll give us an overview of uh, Aqueduct and how business leaders can use it to manage the risk and prepare for the future. Thanks very much, Mary, and good morning, everybody. It's really great to be on this call with you uh, and with Veronica um, Bloody, who I've known for some time, is gonna be talking also about water sense. So, um, I'm excited to have a chance to share with you some work that we've been doing at World Resources Institute uh, and our Aqueduct Global Water Risk Mapping Tool. Maybe one minute of background before I dive into that about World Resources Institute. Uh, WRI has been around for about 35 years. We're a global environment and international development think tank. Uh, we work on issues like food, forests, water, which is the program that I direct globally. Uh, cities, energy, climate, and we also look at how business, <laughs> governance questions, finance, and economics can play a role in providing better development for people around the world while also uh, sustaining the environment. The goal of our water program is to provide easy access to the best publicly available global data to help decision makers first understand and then mitigate water risks. 
And we focus a lot in the water program and in the aqueduct uh, effort on uh, providing that information. So informing about risks, providing better global information about the impacts on people uh, and economies. Um, and I'm going to talk about the relationship to, to business here in a moment. And then we also do work on enabling solutions and um, mobilizing action. I hope you heard that nice motorcycle going by. Yeah. Um, so let me dive into um, some background about the aqueduct tool. I realized about five years ago or so, maybe coming up on six years ago, we did a lot of work and we still do uh, with the business sector, um, many global 500 corporations, that they were beginning to feel the impacts of water-related risks to their businesses, uh, impacts from too little water, too much, and too dirty. But they didn't always have good access to information. They're, the world is honestly awash in data. As many of you know, we're in a big data revolution. But a lot of it is not consistent with other pieces of information or data. It's very difficult to access and find. And so we set out to create a platform to bring this information together with global coverage and to find the best, most up-to-date, most high-resolution or granular data that we could. And thus, the Aqueduct tool was born. Three years ago, we launched the current version of Aqueduct, and I wanted to kind of walk you through uh, what it is. We're working, as I said, with many of the Global 500 companies. I think it's fair to say that there are other resources that are out there, certainly, that are public access like this, but I think it's been largely regarded as a go-to resource uh, in the business sector. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how many companies are moving beyond just risk assessment and starting to take action uh, either through different kinds of services or thinking about how they can manage water differently at the watershed level um, with gover government and civil society organizations as well. So um, let me go to the slide, Mary, uh, that has some uh, text on it that says aqueduct measuring and mapping water risks. Okay, here we are. Um, and, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and so what aqueduct allows you to look at or understand is surface water supply and demand by sector. So we, at the moment, we're using a NASA-based uh, global model that looks at an average of 60 years of monthly data on precipitation and runoff, how that precipitation then moves through the environment from small streams to larger streams and surface waters, how water is being withdrawn for agriculture, municipal, and industrial uses, how much of that is being redischarged. This is based on a tremendous amount of research that's gone into you know, creating a model that can help us understand that. So that's the supply model. And then we can also look at demand by sector countries report on total withdrawals in water demand, and we work with a UN agency, the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, to get that information, and then we spatially disaggregate it based on a methodology, which if anybody's interested, you can find all of this detailed information on methodology and data sources and so on on the Aqueduct website. It's all publicly available. So what it allows you to do is look at essentially competition for water how much water, surface water, is available, how much water is being withdrawn. And then we create a heat map, which I'll show you in a moment, of where there's high risk. So anywhere from 60 to 80% of total uh, available surface water supplies that are being withdrawn means that an area is at high risk. There's a lot of demand for that water. There's obviously economic growth, uh, especially in developing countries. And so one needs to understand what the competition is, what the dynamics are there. We also look at groundwater, and about a year from now, we're going to be updating all of our data sets to 2014. Right now, they're uh, at um, the latest data that's available is uh, 2010. And the groundwater data that we have is very incomplete globally, but we're going to be bringing online a much more complete groundwater data set which is based on a similar model to the surface water data set. The reason that matters is that it allows us to look conjunctively at surface and groundwater. Very, very important in many parts of the world. Where surface water is not available, people are withdrawing groundwater and vice versa. 
We also look at water supply variability, so we can understand seasonal variability month to month and also interannual variability. And what's quite interesting about this is that what we're seeing in many parts of the world is that even areas that are relatively water rich or whose demand, where demand does not, you know, really even meet supply, there's plenty of supply, what we're seeing is a lot of increases in interannual variability. Translated meaning more severe droughts, more severe floods, often in the same places. So there's a greater um, uncertainty around what water will be available and where. We also have information on flood and drought occurrence, um, upstream water storage capacity. We bring all of these 12 indicators together into a composite index of water risk, uh, which you can change by different type of industry, different weightings among those uh, different elements. But the supply and demand element, what we call baseline water stress, has proven to be the most important uh, element out there. There's really not, no information like this that's consistent globally. What we've also done in the last year is brought um, online projections of future water stress. So we look at three different potential trajectories of water demand and changes in water supply related to uh, climate change, different global circulation models that try to predict in the future what, or forecast, what different kinds of precipitation patterns we may see. So it provides different plausible future scenarios of, of water stress. And the takeaway message from this, and it does it for 20, uh, 2020, 2030, and 2040, the really interesting thing from this analysis is that almost no matter where you are globally, the primary driver of future water stress is not supply, but it's demand. And the good news about that is that there are things that we can do to help reduce demand while still maintaining uh, the kinds of societies we want to have and economic, um, economic activity. I'm around my phone. So we do this for 15,000 catchments globally. That's about three orders of magnitude, more granular. Um, and we bring online um, an updated uh, data set next year. Um, we'll be able to go an order of magnitude even more granular uh, than that. The next slide is just the screenshot of what the Aqueduct Water Risk Atlas tool looks like. And just to give you a, a sense of um, this is showing baseline water stress. That's that metric that's a ratio of supply to demand for surface water. And as I said, you see it in a sort of heat map um, context here. And it allows you um, to look at the various, uh, this screenshot is a little difficult to see, but in the lower left, look at different elements like the interannual variability or you know the other factors. As I said, the, the weight distribution allows you to pick different industries and get a general weighting that makes sense for that industry of the different factors. But it also allows you to go in and customize and turn off certain indicators, more heavily weight other indicators as is appropriate for your business or your interests. Um, and then the, just the last thing I would note um, is that, you know, there are a lot of applications of this information. I have just one slide here that shows um, what happens when you take the areas of irrigated agriculture around the world and overlay them on the baseline water stress information in aqueduct. And what we see, of course, and not a big surprise, is that areas like California's Central Valley or, um, you know, Arizona, Mexico, where lots of crops and produce uh, that are provided to the U.S. are grown, or uh, Chile, Central Valley, where a lot of us get our um, fruit and vegetables, uh, you know, out of summer season and so on around the world. Um, much of the world, it says here, 50 percent of irrigated agriculture is in areas of high or extremely high water stress. We've done similar kinds of analyses for um, coal-fired power plants. Uh, and other thermoelectric cooled power plants. There's many different kinds of applications that can be made for policy purposes and for specific um, business purposes, whether for direct operation locations or for supply chain mapping uh, business risk. What I didn't say too is that the Aqueduct tool allows you to put in over 250 locations at a given time and you get an uh, instant printout and an Excel spreadsheet across all the different indicators of water-related risk. You just can put in a lat long or an actual street location, or you can drop a pin in a map. So it allows you to do that where there are areas that are of interest uh, for you. Yeah, There's a lot more I could say, but that's probably plenty. I'll stop there.
Uh huh. Uh, well, an excellent overview and exactly what we wanted for our audience, which includes uh, business users who are working to manage uh, risk and increase the resiliency. And I actually was um, referred to your organization because of a Global 500 user who used Aqueduct to identify where they should be building plants in the future because they need to have access to the water to keep those plants operational. So uh, it is extremely valuable. And uh, you mentioned uh, the value of uh, managing future demand. And that leads us to our next speaker, whom I'd like to uh, turn to Barb Higgins of Plumbing Manufacturers International to um, introduce because she was the one who referred uh, EPA's water sense to us and has also been working on the authorization. So Barb, if you're on the line, if you could open up um, your microphone and share with us an update on the authorization and introduce Veronica. Sure, I'm here. Can, am, I, am I on, on the yep. air here? <laughs> Live. Okay. Yep, we'll hear you. Yeah, thank you. Well, well thanks uh, again, Mary, for uh, putting all this, uh, this group together. And PMI has a wonderful long history with uh, EPA and the WaterSense program. It represents a, a very successful partnership between industry and government that brought us uh, the latest and greatest generation of high efficiency <laughs> products. And uh, we very much enjoy working with Veronica and her team. And with that uh, introduction, uh, and uh, Veronica, I guess I'll see you later this week. I'm in Washington, D.C. this week, and we'll see you, uh, uh, looks like Wednesday night. But uh, with that, let me turn it over to her and let her fill you in on all the, the beauty of water sense here. Great. Thanks, Barb. Um, and thanks, Mary, for inviting me uh, to join Betsy today on the webinar. So the WaterSense program, um, hopefully most of you have heard of it by this time, but sometimes people still haven't. Uh, we started in 2006, so almost 10 years ago. Uh, we're similar in structure to Energy Star, although we are much smaller. So we are a program that's focused primarily on developing specifications to identify more water efficient products. But we have expanded our um, program into homes. We label new homes, and we are also moving more into the commercial sector. Um, Barb did not actually mention the status of authorization language on the Hill, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, Energy Star is a formally authorized program. They received authorization about 10 years into the history of their program, and so we have been seeking a similar authorization for our program, or actually I don't know that we have been seeking it, but our stakeholders have been seeking it for the past several years. Um, and this year, we do have legislation that has been included in the Senate and House versions of the Energy Bill. So there is language to authorize water sense um, in those bills. And so if you look um, at that language of the Senate bills, you'll see that language in there. And we're, we're hopeful that maybe here in the 10th year of our program, much like Energy Star, we'll be able to see formal authorization come. If you come to our website here, on, on the right, you'll see um, a screenshot of the website section that we have that's dedicated to commercial information. And so we have a, a lot of information that's there that I'll talk about here in a few minutes. But this is a good, if you look on the right sidebar there, you can get a good sense of the types of materials that we have on there. So we can go to the next slide. And I'm actually really happy today that Betsy was on the call because when I started going out and talking to um, business communities, businesses, I really did rely on sort of the structure of this, uh, the aqueduct. Aqueduct has this nice kind of paradigm for how they talk about water risk that they include in some of their presentations um, that really talks about how if you're going to manage water risk, you've got three areas that you're basically focused on. The physical part, which is the quantity element, the physical part, that's the quality element, and then the reputational and regulatory risk that you might face. Um, and so the Aqueduct tool is good at, at giving you information about all those risks. And I like to say when I'm talking to audiences that the WaterSense program can help you kind of mitigate and address the risks that you might face on the quantity side and on the reputational side and potentially the regulatory side because there are some states that have moved forward to set um, limits on withdrawals for surface water and groundwater. So it really does behoove you to show that you're being as efficient as possible um, to address those different risks. And so here we've got on the left, why saving water, reducing the risk by reducing that uncertainty. When we look at the increase in water and sewer rates relative to other utilities um, and relative to the consumer price index, we definitely see that rates 
um, are starting to increase. They are still really low relative to what other countries might pay for water and sewer, but they are starting to increase, and so the value of water is becoming more um, heightened, so people will start to see that economic signal telling them that they need to start um, managing it more thoughtfully. Um, the other thing is on drought and short water sh other water shortages, certainly in California, we've seen a big push this year in the last few years to um, get homeowners and get businesses to start looking at how they're managing water so that they can inc improve their resilience to, to drought because we know that the rain will probably come again, but drought will definitely um, be on its heels at some point in the future. So improving your wa water efficiency will help inc improve your resilience. Um, we know on the operational cost side, um, just like in water and sewer, you're paying for water every time you're touching it. You're paying for when it's coming in the building. You're paying for it's leaving the building. And sometimes you're paying for the use on site. So if you have cooling towers and you're paying for chemicals, you're having to pay for that, um, the, the operational cost for that water. So saving water will help you save those operational costs. And also it will help you save energy because there's an energy footprint associated with water. Hot water savings can be pretty significant um, if you're saving water. And we see actually when we look at our water savings nationally that um, probably 40 to 50 percent of the utility bills that savings that we estimate are from energy bill um, savings. So you can maximize profit margins by saving on all those resources. Um, and then contributing to organizational sustainability goals. Uh, we see more and more businesses that are looking to um, highlight their corporate sustainable their CSR work by going and having their buildings labeled through LEED. Uh, LEED water efficiency criteria and water sense um, products are included in those criteria. And then just within your community, you're, you're going to improve your reputation by showing your commitment to the wise use of resources. And in situations like the drought in California, definitely you want to be seen as a business leader and not as a person who's sort of um, sucking the local community dry for a better, a better thought. Um, the how, how a water sense focuses on helping communities and businesses and people do that is three Ps. There are products that we um, work to label, practices, best practices that we try and help promote, and then the people side of it. We have partners like PMI, um, water utilities, local governments, state governments. We have professionals that we certify in the landscape um, irrigation area that are professionals and know how to help you improve um, your efficiency. And then just, but people are so important. Um, a lot of the water savings are behavioral. You want people to be able to know how to use water efficiently, but you need to, them to do it. You need them to be paying attention. You need them to be reporting. So it really does um, bring people into the picture. You go to the next slide. So this is just um, the label uh, that look for here, the mark. Um, that you see on products that have earned the label. Um, these are the products that we've labeled to date on the left. Um, our most recent one is flushometer valve toilets that came out in December. So we um, expect to see those hitting the shelves shortly. So these products are all at least 20% more efficient than national standards models. Um, in some cases, it's even more than that. Our flushing urinal specification is 50% more efficient than the national standard. And actually, we have labeled models that can use as little as a pint of water. So these are all, we develop the specifications, but we rely on independent third-party certification. So these products are all um, tested, and they're um, assessed, and they're provided the label by a third-party certifier. And when you go and look at the label, you'll see who, who the certification body is underneath the the label in the field. We have more than 16,000 product models to date that have earned the label. We know that there are water utilities um, across the country that are rebating many of these products, so you can um, look to see if there are rebates available. Sometimes we're asked about some of the products that Energy Star uh, dishwashers, commercial clothes washers. Energy Star does label those products already because of their energy use, but we also work with them. Um, they include water factors to ensure that those um, products are also water efficient. So if you have a product that's Energy Star labeled that uses water, you can be assured that it is also going to be water efficient. I think you can go to the next um, slide. So here, um, just like I said, we started out, our focus was primarily on consumers. 
but we did see that there was a need to try and give guidance to the business community as well. So in 2012, we released a pretty extensive um, document of best management practices. It's about 400 pages of um, best management practices for um, commercial and institutional facilities. And to try and work to promote that out to different sectors, we chose the hospitality sector in 2014 and 2015 to challenge them to start to take action to improve their water efficiency, primarily because they have all, they use most of the products that we do label, and they also do have a pretty significant water footprint, and they'd already sort of set the path forward with some of the programs that they'd done on like linen reuse. So we did engage with them in 2014, 2015, this is a challenge, the hotel challenge that we have. It's still available for hotels to pick up, and we see hotels continue to engage, and we have lots of materials that they can use to help them. But basically, it's a three-step process, and this works with any facility. You're really, we're really trying to encourage them to act, to assess their water use, to put in metering, to put in sub-metering where possible, to conduct those simple assessments, to evaluate how they're using water, and find those opportunities that they can do to reduce water use. Um, to change, to implement some of our best management practices, um, you know, installing equipment can actually give you pretty quick returns on investment in some cases, so um, it's important to look for those and take action where you can. And then tracking, tracking the progress before and after you're implementing those practices. The portfolio manager um, platform that the Energy Star program has developed for its business Partners um, also is able to capture water information, so we recommend that as a platform that folks can use to um, track their use. And Energy Star, the, the partners that Energy Star has, has increasingly come to them over the past couple of years and said, you know, we've done a lot on energy, we've got our energy use down, but we want to do more, and so what can we do? Or they're seeing their water rates go up and they need to try and start addressing that. So Energy Star has been coming to us more and more to say, like, help, we need help with our, our partners. And so we are this year carrying out a webinar series with Energy Star. Uh, we've had two to date. The next one is May 10th on mechanical systems. And if you go to our website, you'd be able to see information about those, those webinars that we would encourage you to go to. Also, last year we did a series of webinars um, with, um, in partnership with HUD to address multifamily housing, uh, significant water use there. And also, um, we are working with Energy Star to develop a water score benchmark for multifamily housing that we hope to get out later this year. So if you go to the WaterSense website, you'll see we have no, numerous resources that are available to help you, including our BMP documents, the webinars that we have that are recorded. Um, we have water assessment tools and tracking tools. And if you went back to that slide on the right, you would see sort of a highlights of a case study that we did with Caesars Entertainment, who has taken a, a big step forward on water efficiency, and we have a number of uh, case studies for different types of sectors, different types of water use within facilities that you can go to, read about the successful stories of these um, businesses, um, and then try and replicate it in your own programs. So I think that is all I have, Mary. Uh, that is wonderful, Betsy. I'm sorry, Veronica, that's exactly what we wanted. And uh, uh, you bring up the point that all of this material is already available, and that was such a thrills for us to find because in all honesty, uh, you also mentioned some businesses don't yet know about these tools and it's shocking really, but, um, but that um, they are available, that the assessments are there so you can go in and download the assessment and actually start to calculate what your savings could be. So if you're going through a remodel or if you're uh, just wondering about the energy loss that you might have due to inefficient products, uh, that can often make the economic case. And if not, as you mentioned, Veronica, the rebate and additional incentives that states are putting in place because they realize there's tremendous value there. And i just like to bring up um, San Antonio uh, was really innovative in the way they approached a water sense, uh, getting the community on board as well as uh, implementing across uh, the municipality uh, water-saving toilets and faucets. And uh, they have a case study out if you look up um, saws um, and they also have a fun example because one of the issues with water sense when it was first introduced was that um, the system's nature of water requires the flow levels in the pipes to be at a certain um, 
level in order to handle what's going through um, the, the plumbing. And uh, there were challenges because the systems weren't all working together. So what Saws put together was a flush of a potato down a toilet to prove the quality of all of the products today uh, that they are really uh, handling anything at the same level of any other commercially available product, but as you said, delivering at least 20% savings. So it's an exciting time where the tools are available. And uh, also, congratulations to you on your 10-year anniversary. If you go to the Water Sense site, folks, you can see that 1.1 trillion gallons in savings, which is uh, equivalent to more than 20 billion in utility bill savings all for an investment in the WaterSense team of $2 million a year across the last 10 years. So this is really something that we want to advocate is authorized, and uh, I think anything you can do with your congressmen, senators, uh, to note your support of the EPA and WaterSense, that would be great. But um, I want to open it up for questions because we have a team of experts on the call who likely have some other questions. But to start out, I'd like to just um, ask Betsy and Veronica, let's say I'm a Global 2000 business, and um, why should I come to you, and what would be the difference that um, your solutions would make? So that, And maybe you use an example of a specific business that came. So Betsy, if you could start. Sure. I'll use an example of one of our Aqueduct Alliance members, uh, Procter & Gamble, which has operations, I think, uh, manufacturing operations in 250 places around the world. Uh, and they did a lot of analysis themselves, including their sustainability group, which has a couple of PhDs among them, to try and understand what should they even be looking at? What kind of data could they, you know, go get and so on? And they... Um, Ran across Aqueduct and a couple of other tools. There's a tool called the Water Risk Filter, which the World Wildlife uh, Fund has worked on with some uh, German experts. And there are other tools out there um, as well. And what they did was they, they used it, Aqueduct as an initial. They dropped the pin or put in the location for their manufacturing um, sites. And they used it as a sort of initial screening tool uh, to understand where they may be facing water-related risks and what kind. And then they went and talked to the plant managers in those places, and they said, are you aware that, you know, we're in a highly stressed water basin, or have you experienced any disruptions to operations or, you know, challenges of any kind? Or here are the reputational risks, as Veronica was pointing out, that we see, and we have a couple indicators that, that look at that. Um, and so that allowed them to sort of do some due diligence um, and there were definitely some instances where plant managers were not aware of the potential risks, um, you know, in the area. And then they would develop a plan uh, essentially for doing everything they could within the four walls of the operations to reduce water risk through, you know, process decisions and so on um, to reduce water use, I should say. But in some cases, uh, Procter & Gamble is the largest discharger, for example, of treated effluent or untreated in some instances, or they may be the largest withdrawer of water for their various processes. Uh, and so they also, uh, you know, they used it as a way of thinking about how they needed to engage with other stakeholders uh, in, the, in the watersheds where they operated and government. And I'll give you one other example um, that Procter & Gamble uh, also looked at. Um, you might know that the Rio and Sao Paulo areas in Brazil have been going through a very bad drought, not quite as bad as California's. But what was happening is that Procter & Gamble's laundry detergent um, sales were dropping because there literally was not enough water. People were not doing as much laundry. And so they used that information and they looked at, you know, what the potential future of interannual variability of water avail available water might be to say that it made sense from a business perspective to formulate uh, a new kind of um, laundry detergent that required less rinsing uh, and, and thus less water. And so, you know, all ends, all parts of the value chain are uh, engaged when companies are thinking about water-related risks. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think uh, manufacturers, too, are using less water in paint. They're finding ways to use air rather than water to, uh, to clean things. So uh, very fascinating, Betsy. Thank you. And Veronica? Well, we have a, a bit of a different model than um, the WRI does, so I think that they're working much more closely with corporate-level um, entities. And I would, you know, recommend that tool as, as an excellent way for uh, 
senior people in companies to really get a sense of the risk that their facilities could face due to, to water challenges. Um, for us, you know, we've been approached by uh, federal, other federal agencies, so I was mentioning HUD and in the Energy Star world, some, uh, many of the multifamily folks have like, um, people who manage multifamily housing have approached Energy Star. So we do, one of the things that we're doing for that is, is like I said, we're developing this benchmark to be able to assess a water score um, to buildings so that they will be able to kind of see where they lie on the spectrum of um, what they is anticipated that they, their best use would be and then see how they um, play out. Um, for companies, you know, when individual companies approach us and ask us to make presentations, often they actually are trying to get um, at, their, um, at the people who work in their buildings. Um, so much of the water use is uh, you know, we have the, a relationship with water that's a lot more physical than, than we have with energy, say. Um, and so really they want to get people to have a better understanding of the actions that they take within the facility and the um, implications of it. So getting the staff within the buildings to report leaks if they see leaks, um, to uh, use water more efficiently within their pantries, within their um, outdoor irrigation. So it's really more about the behavioral side um, than sort of like the bigger picture that Betsy provides in the risk management. Yeah, and I think that's mentioned also in the Caesars case study, the importance of getting all of the, um, the folks who are managing the facility to understand when people set aside their, their towels that they didn't need to throw them in the you know, wash, keep them separate so that they do save that water and uh, um, right. that internal process education is as important often as the product. But um, what, one concern that was raised in um, um, PMI put out a, a news release, I think, in last fall talking about how California has been challenged with, you know, managing to 20% reduced water use, and yet the use of the WaterSense products is shown to be under uh, about 5% for the toilets and about 20% for the faucets, suggesting a huge opportunity for more people to install. And I'd like to throw it out to the group. If you have ideas for, uh, for Veronica or, or for Betsy on how they might expand or, or share this information more broadly, and we will do it with Global Water Work, but specific uh, suggestions for how your organizations also could showcase their work, uh, we invite those on this call. And um, were there any questions from, um, from the participants? I'll just uh, ask, and the mic is open, so anyone can voice those. Uh, Mary, this is Shah Jan. I have a question. Great. Go ahead, Shah Jan. Uh, First, um, enjoyed both presentations very much. Uh, Betsy's organization, is it uh, uh, aware of uh, this Alliance for Water Stewardship? Uh, is there some uh, similarity or uh, collaboration opportunity? They are based here at the, the American operation is based here at the Water Center in Milwaukee. <laughs> and also, second, one of the companies that uh, uh, is going up that uh, uh, at the water center is a company called Wellintel, which is looking to uh, provide groundwater information uh, from wells, uh, uh, well water information um, uh, kind of use it for mapping. Uh, I'm just curious if she's aware of uh, those two initiatives. Um, I'm happy to, to answer that. Thank you. Um, great points. I'm glad you raised the Alliance for Water Stewardship, a really um, great effort that the World Wildlife Fund is helping to, to lead, as are many other organizations. And it's lots of companies have joined it. Um, there are um, sort of standards and um, recommended approaches for how companies uh, can engage in helping to reduce uh, watershed uh, stress. So what's happening for many companies, as I was mentioning, even with Procter & Gamble, is that in some instances, companies can do a lot to insulate themselves from water-related challenges within their own four walls, but often they can't. There are things that are happening, poor water management decisions that are being made in the watershed, um, you know, upstream development that's causing downstream flooding and water quality problems and so on. And so the Alliance for Water Stewardship provides strategies and an approach for companies to help engage um, in the watershed with all actors. 
and there's a lot more there. So I, I recommend going to that website and, and learning more about it. So thanks for mentioning that. And I, I did not know about Well Intel. I would love to know more. Um, it's very difficult. I was talking with somebody yesterday at a, at a uh, barbecue um, who is trying to get information on wells even in the U.S. as well as internationally, and it's really difficult to get that information. I mean, one of our challenges in understanding uh, groundwater use is just that literally we don't know all the places where it's being withdrawn. So if there's, a, if there's some information that's out there that's starting to uh, – or a data source is starting to pull some of that together, I'd be very interested to learn more. Yeah, the, the, the infrastructure for that uh, in terms of the product and the uh, web-based. Uh, so essentially a Google map for well information is uh, uh, kind of in development. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Shajan. Was there something more? Yes, I have a couple more quick questions. Uh, I think uh, uh, it was mentioned for WaterSense program. Uh, there are labs that are uh, certifying products. Uh, can that be expanded upon? What labs? And is it something like UL type of labs or something different or NSF? Right. So we have a number of, of certifi certification bodies that we have developed agreements with um, who are in charge of certifying the products. So that would include groups like IATMO. It would include NSF. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure UL is anymore, CSA. Um, those are the types of organizations that we have um, developed relationships with, and those, we have a list of those on our, on our website in the product um, specifications um, section. So you'd be able to find that on our website. If you can't find it, just I can follow up and give it to you directly. Yeah, I'm interested to learn more about that. Uh, and and uh, Betsy, just quick last question. In in the consulting uh, or uh, how people use your data and information, uh, uh, is your people doing that with corporations? Or are you relying on a whole other set of professionals to work with their clients to uh, make the connection and do the interpretation? Yeah, it's all across the board. Um, some companies have come to us directly, and we do engage um, with them, usually more on what we would call thought leadership projects, so not just strict interpretation of aqueduct results for their businesses, but because they're trying to push the envelope a little further. For example, um, some companies that I, I can't name right now are trying to set their own sustainability targets for how they're going to reduce water use with a sort of science informed, because when we're thinking about water, you, you really have to be thinking about it in its context, not just globally. They're trying to set more uh, context appropriate uh, targets that will then also roll up into a, uh, you know, an enterprise wide target. So we're doing some work like that, you know, consulting work, if you want to call it that, even though we're a nonprofit. Um, lots and lots of consulting firms are using Aqueduct. You know, it's totally open source, open access. There are a lot of companies, Bloomberg, MSCI, which provides a lot of information to investors, uh, uses Aqueduct's baseline water stress information. Bloomberg has a lot of our maps up on their terminals. Lots of other firms are actually building applications on top of Aqueduct. This is exactly what we want. We want that kind of broad scale use, and we're, we're happy to see that. Yeah, that is uh, so wonderful to know, Betsy. And also, I think we believe the open data initiatives do enable us to manage what we've always wanted to measure and uh, have, a, have a handle on or actually reverse to, to measure what we've always wanted to manage so that everyone can get the answers that they want. And uh, there's one last question here. Uh, Ronnie? Uh, yes, to, this is both uh, to Betsy and um, Veronica. If you had, if you could get what's at the top of your wish list, for example, if there's a certain obstacle that you'd want to overcome or a certain new resource or tool that you could get your hands on, um, what would be at the top of that wish list um, to move forward? Well, I could jump in on that one. That's a great question. My wish list is long, um, <laughs> but in in terms of uh, in terms of data, for example, I. I would love us to get to the point where the models that we have that can take satellite-based near real-time data would allow us to do better near real-time um, analysis of where water is availability, wa available. It's so complicated because water can be below the surface, you know, 
on the surface flowing in a lake or a river. It can be in vapor in the air. It can be in soil in the form of soil moisture. Um, and the, we're getting to the point where um, there, there's some satellite-based remote-sensed uh, data that hopefully in the next five years, the models will be good enough to allow us to bring all that big data together to have a better snapshot in, in near real time of what's happening with water. Yes, I think that's a vision shared by many people, Betsy, including Elon Musk and uh, the head of our UW-Milwaukee Freshwater Sciences Group, who was at the uh, White House World Water Day. So uh, we say here, here to that. And uh, there is a team actually working on that within our Network for Water group. Um, okay. David Golan is on that. So, um, so we'll keep you apprised and invite you in there. Um, and Thank then, uh, Ver Veronica, your wish list. Well, yeah, I mean, my wish list is also long um, and probably <laughs> needs money, but, um, you know, we are, water efficiency is sort of the kind of the poor cousin to energy efficiency, and I think one of the, the da on the data side, it's also really important, you know, and there's an energy information administration that, at DOE that collects a lot of information. They have this commercial building energy consumption survey, a residential energy consumption survey, um, I really wish that we had sort of a, a similar um, set of data on the water side, and that would allow us to really better benchmark. The benchmarks that we're doing for multifamily are only because of a special um, survey that was done with Fannie Mae, so it probably will be the, the last, the first and last benchmark that we do unless we're able to, like, convince other parties to step forward and do big data collections. Um, so, you know, the data side, I think there's a lot, still a lot of opportunity for improving data on the water side and, and hopefully going forward as people see the increasing importance to ensuring water, um, that will happen. Mary, uh, Barb Higgins here, if I could just jump in briefly. Um, Go ahead, first sir. Of all, I, just, I just wanted to compliment you on the job that you've done in pulling us all together. I just think that's something that's been needed, and you're, you're really uh, picking up some steam here. And I invited Marianne Dickinson of the Alliance for Water Efficiency to join us, and I just wondered in the remaining minutes if we could just let Marianne chime in. Uh, there was a, a comment about some of the other organizations that are dedicated to water efficiency, and hers is one of those. So, Marianne, not to put you on the spot, but maybe just take a minute or two to kind of position what you guys are doing? Oh, thank you so much, Barb. Um, I, I think many of you on the call probably know the Alliance for Water Efficiency, but like WaterSense, we have been uh, active for about nine years now, um, and we are a stakeholder organization that supports sustainable and affordable water efficiency solutions, um, largely in the water utility space where a lot of water conservation programs occur, but also across business and industry where there's significant uptake of water sense products and other um, you know, water efficient technologies. And so we, we conduct research, we uh, do uh, public outreach, we work with uh, our utility and business and industry members on uh, technical assistance on their water conservation programs. We help plan water efficiency activities that um, will resonate with um, development of new supplies and, and avoiding costs for um, meeting demand that, you know, don't need to be um, met if you're reducing water demand to an efficient level of use. And Veronica talked about that in her comments. So that's the kind of analysis we also focus on. We do advocacy. Uh, sorry, had a little blip here with the phone. Uh, we do advocacy on policy and uh, other issues, and we work very closely with um, water efficiency-oriented stakeholders, both in the nonprofit world, in the business world, and the water utility world. Um, our URL is allianceforwaterefficiency.org, and we have a couple of other websites, a Home Water Works website where the consumer can get information and uh, financing sustainable water website, um, and all of those can be accessed from our homepage, uh, that gets at the issue of utility loss and revenues from water efficiency and how to plan for and actually optimize uh, those issues. Yes. Oh, so wonderful to have you on, um, Marianne. I've admired your work, and Marianne has a phenomenal wish list, which is included in our inspirational videos on our YouTube site, uh, talking about how the industry could transform with the real-time data that both of uh, our speakers mentioned, as well as uh, 
uh, business taking action and using the financial models that uh, Alliance for Water Efficiency has provided, which we are using as members. So uh, Barb, thank you so much for uh, uh, including Marianne in our call. And uh, these are biweekly calls. Uh, there are a few uh, different events coming up from the speakers and participants here. Sweetwater of Southern um, Wisconsin Watershed is hosting their event in Milwaukee, and uh, that's this Thursday, and then we have uh, IAPMO um, hosting their Innovative Technology Symposium right here in Rosemont. Um, um, it's May 10th, 11th, and 12th, I believe. And then, uh, and those events are listed on the Facebook site, the Facebook pages for um, Global Water Works. They're also available in our LinkedIn group, which is Network for Water, and we invite you to join in there. And then I want to mention, too, uh, the Water Council, which uh, Shajan mentioned, is hosting their summit on uh, June 15th, and that's a phenomenal gathering of, of water workers. And then finally, um, on June 29th, we will be in um, Los Angeles with uh, the Israel-California uh, Water Conference to introduce financial models to address uh, the California drought and to share the case studies and the good work already being done with the desalination plants there. So um, those financial models were just shared within our LinkedIn group and are uh, a game changer as far as creating partner partnerships between private and public interests to um, to bring in the funding to actually change the municipal infrastructure and uh, pay for it over time uh, with these partnerships. So I encourage everyone who's involved in advocating for change to download those um, from that LinkedIn group. And uh, any other questions, uh, chime in on our Global Waterworks site, info at globalwaterworks.org. But uh, we are here, as, as I said at the beginning, to celebrate and uh, to spread the word on the experts who have already created the resources and the water saving technology. And, uh, and we are just delighted to have so many of those experts, or as I tell my team, the water rock stars were here today. And uh, so uh, Betsy, Veronica, Marianne, and Barb, Thank you, and Shahjan for leading the education efforts, and, and Ronnie for linking us up with Israel, and uh, for all of you who have participated today, uh, we just hope you'll continue to spread the word and uh, help us make water work for all future generations. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mary. Thank you, yeah. Mary. Take care, team.